So Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, we, uh, this is the, kind of this time in between where the holidays are still going on. We've celebrated the birth of Christ, and in church we celebrate Christmas even longer for 12 days. Uh, so you'll see the, the tree and the wreaths continuing up through next Sunday. Uh, but we've got this, this newness to focus on this week. And with the new year comes this clean slate. And it comes an opportunity to, to get our lives a, a new direction, to try to get on board with what God wants to do. You know, it's, it's amazing how our culture uses starts like this, like January 1st, to kind of reset everything. I've talked to a lot of people who've said, well, I had to squeeze in this surgery or this doctor's appointment before the end of the year, before my deductible starts over. Uh, that may be you. Uh, that's, that's very wise. Uh, for some of us, uh, you know, end of year giving kind of has, has to happen because the reset button hits on January 1st and you're in a new tax year. And so New Year's create this very interesting kind of complex set of issues that we have to deal with. I want to talk about that today. I also want to talk about our resolutions uh, and, and those that, that we've made and maybe haven't lived up to in the past and why that is. Uh, but first, I want to start with this really cute video. This is New Year's from a child's perspective. Watch this. Happy New Year! <laughs> How do we celebrate New Year's? By staying up all night long. And we get sparkling cider. Some people stay up till midnight. I fell asleep a lot. What happens at midnight? The ball in New York City drops. Everybody's happy. We celebrate. It's weird when we have to um, K I S S kiss. <laughs> Gross. What are your New Year's resolutions? I have sweets all the time. A backflip. Change my name to Sparkly. Every week, a movie night, a game night, and a Gilligan's Island night. Have lots of time with my grandparents. I would like to try wasabi. I like to get a unicorn and bunnies. What's the thing you want to do most with your life? I want to be an NFL kicker, be the best cellist in the world, and be the best Lego builder in the world. Going to all the continents. A missionary. And when I ride a deer, pharmaceutical rep, because that's what my dad does. Have like cool bedroom with like cool posters and a hot tub and a ladder in my closet and have like a secret lab. I want to get married to Kian. It would be a pony wedding with lots of ponies and have twin girls, Maddie and Madison. Why is it not good to give up? Then you'll never achieve what you could. Even if you have some rough times, you don't give up. You keep going. Someday you will get it. You don't ever say you can't get it. If you give up, you might be missing out because one day you will get it. And it will be really awesome <laughs> when you do. How can you help someone to not give up? Encouraging them, giving them advices for stuff. Say, you're doing a good job. Um, I like to hug people and kiss them. And I'll give them a toy. Then I'll say, I'll be your best friend. So come on, come on. since I can do it, then, I'll, then, then I will teach you how to do it. Why does God change us? Because he loves us. He loves us so much. He knows that we need to be changed sometimes. And he wants us to have a better life. He doesn't want us to be lost. He wants us to come home to Him. How does God change us? Puts all the good things in our hearts. He changes us by giving us something to believe in. Why is it important to give someone a second chance? When you're giving someone a second chance, you're trusting them and believing in them. So that we're like not caught up on something that we've done and can't really move on. To have a new beginning. What would you tell someone who didn't believe God could change them? That Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And He can change you because He's Jesus. Keep praying and He will change you. You will feel it. Because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Happy New Year! Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. What'd y'all think? It's pretty good. So there's got to be more to a new year and a new beginning than what we make of it. 
This video has caused me to reflect a little bit on New Year's past in my own life. For, for many years, uh, my family had a DJ business that I took over, so for decades uh, of my life, I was always at somebody else's New Year's party when the clock struck midnight and that one year changed to another. And so we, we would always see people dancing the night away and having a great time. And I always knew when it was getting close to midnight every year because you would start to see all the, the, the stuff get passed out. Uh, you'd see the, the little noisemakers, you know, those things, and the streamers that burst open uh, when you squeeze it or pop the top, and those goofy glasses that have the year across. And 2011 was odd because you had two zero and then like a one in front of your eye, and that was always really weird. I thought, how are you going to see through a one? Uh, but we always, always wear those awkward glasses. And then there's those spinner things that sound like... Like, all right, we have a cold on New Year's. This is great. Uh, so, but, but that always happens. And then uh, I could always let clockwork know because people were always watching their watches and getting ready. So we'd fade out whatever song we were playing. We would start the countdown. Everybody would count together. Ten, nine, eight. And then Happy New Year. And we'd play Old Lang Syne. And folks would pass out cider or champagne. And, and then there'd always be black eyed peas and cabbage. I always thought, man, that's the last thing I want to have at midnight is black eyed peas and cabbage. But okay, we do it on New Year's. Uh, this, is, this is really awesome. And so that was my celebration of New Year's, and that's all I knew for about the first 20 years of my life. I didn't really realize there was a crystal ball in New York that, that dropped uh, to bring in the new year until I was in my 20s. And life really, really changed, especially after my wife and I got married and moved to North Carolina. Uh, we spent some New Year's up there, and all of my friends at seminary went back to their hometowns for New Year's, and so it was just me and her. And we had wonderful times celebrating together, going out to dinner and watching a movie and then going home and watching the ball drop in New York and, and all of that. I, I realize as I've gotten a little older and, and gotten married that I don't like to stay up as late as I used to. And so we became our custom to watch the ball drop at 11 o'clock and go, well, yay, midnight has reached the American shores. <laughs> Happy New Year, everybody. And then, uh, then go to bed. That's changed even more now that we have a son who doesn't care whether we stay up until 1 in the morning or we go to bed at 8. He's going to be up at the same early hour every single day. And so I know if we stay up until midnight this year, we're going to pay for it for half of 2014, just trying to get caught up on everything. I began to think about today, having watched this video, what is it that we, we do when we celebrate the new year? We get together to celebrate many things throughout the year. There's birthdays and anniversary. Somebody graduates from high school or college, you get together and have a party. A soldier comes home, we celebrate that. If someone gets engaged or married, you throw a big party to celebrate but what is it exactly that we're celebrating on New Year's? Maybe this year you're celebrating some accomplishments that have come your way. Maybe you've gotten a promotion at work or you found the job of your dreams. Maybe you've gotten married or moved into a new house. Maybe your children have accomplished something great and you look back and you go, man, what a great year this was. Maybe you're just celebrating the fact that the year is over. You look back and go, man, you know, I had a family member that went through a difficult time with his health and, and recovered, but boy, that was tough. And, and man, I, I, financially, it just has been really tough this year. And you look back and maybe you struggled academically for a little bit and you go, I'm just glad that 2013 is behind me and that I have a fresh start and the slate is wiped clean in 2014. I think we celebrate because of that. But we look back, but we also look forward. We always approach a new year with hope. Things have got to be better. I've got to be happier this year. Things, things have to be different in my life. And so traditionally, we set these goals that we call resolutions. We don't call any other goals in our lives resolutions, but we do it New Year's for some reason. We want to resolve to do some things. Uh, and they're usually pretty popular uh, things, and, and they're usually very similar. So sometimes I like to do a Google search when I'm preparing my messages because that shows really what our culture is learning because whatever comes up first in Google is what people are reading and educating themselves with. And so this is what I found. Uh, if you want to accomplish the, the common New Year's resolutions this year, this was near the top of the list, USA.gov, our government website, has links to ways that you can accomplish the goals. So, so if you want to eat healthier, there's a government website for that. I thought this one was funny. If you want to save more, there's a government website for that. I thought, don't they take your money instead of save? It was really, really weird, but they have a website for that. So that was really good. And then there were links to things that, that you could actually go and they'll tell you what your resolution should be and just click and give them your money and then they'll help you accomplish the resolutions, which was really smart. I thought from a business standpoint, I thought, man, I, I just don't have these ideas early enough. This is brilliant. And, and then uh, after that, most of the rest of the first page was just kind of a joke. You know you're going to make New Year's resolutions anyway and you know you're never going to keep them, so let's just list all the ones that you're going to make and not keep. 
And I thought about the truth in that. I mean, there's several articles that were kind of geared that way. And I thought, you know, that's true. I make resolutions every single year. And I very rarely find myself looking back at the end of the year going, yeah, yeah, I kept that. I accomplished that. Maybe it's because I'm going about it all wrong. I think New Year's could be something even more meaningful for us. Uh, it, more than just these things that we want to see happen in our lives uh, that we don't end up keeping, but maybe to look forward to what God can do. Uh, I want to study briefly this morning John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. If you've got your Bible or your smartphone, I invite you to read along as we camp out in this chapter today. So listen now to a word from God from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from, John, from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who belonged to his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is God's Word for us today. Thanks be to God. So John doesn't just start at the beginning of a new year. And John doesn't just start at the birth of Jesus, which we just celebrated this last week. John goes all the way back at the beginning of his gospel, before the very first page, this like presentation page and table of contents, it's even before that, to the very, very beginning. He says, before a word was written in this book, before anything that we know about, that we have seen and experienced has been created, all there was was this word, this wisdom and power that was with God and from God and was God. And every single thing that has been brought into being, every animal, every plant, every vegetable, every uh, cell, every element, every single human being, the air that we breathe, the sky around us, was created by the power and the wisdom of God. Think about that for a minute. There is not one thing that has been created outside of the wisdom and power of God. Isn't that amazing? It says that this, this very word that was with God came, came down and brought life. Life. It's about life coming from God. There's a lot of things that take life from us. We feel like zap our time and our energy. But this light and this life came from the energy the wisdom and the power of God in the beginning that animated all things. John says this life was the light of all people. Light is an amazing thing. And right now I can barely see all of you because of the bright lights. Hopefully it means that you can see me. But I don't know if any of you have ever been in complete and total darkness. Sometimes on Halloween we like to do this on purpose to scare ourselves. But when we find ourselves in this situation and it's not Halloween, it's pretty scary and we usually want to find a way out of it. I'm not just talking dark where there's some stars in the sky at night. I'm talking complete, utter darkness where you can't see your hand in front of your face, kind of dark. Any of you ever been in that situation? It can be scary because you don't know what's around you. You don't feel like you can take the next step forward because you don't know if you're going to trip and fall, if something's right there at your foot. You just have no idea. And in that kind of darkness, just the smallest light just a pin size, a fiber optic size light would illuminate your path and change that whole situation. I remember being a young boy and I was frightened of the dark. And my parents would always turn on a light, a night light, before they turned off the big lights so I could go to sleep. 
And it brought me comfort after they left my room because I could always see what was around me and I felt safe and secure. Light always overcomes darkness. And John says, this light shone in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. That's the kind of life that comes from God. Think about this. In the very beginning, before God spoke anything into being, all there was was darkness, this formless void where nothing yet existed. Then God spoke and brought forth light. It's that way in our lives too before Christ, that our our lives are a formless void. We live in the darkness of this world until Christ shines in. And all of a sudden, he illumines our soul. He gives us his life, and we realize what it is that we've been missing all this time. We realize why we were created and what we were created for. John next teaches us that there was this man named John. It's not the one writing the gospel, but it's another John that we call John the Baptist. And he came before the light to testify that the light from God, the wisdom and power that came from the very beginning of the ages, was coming into the world. John was there to point others to the light so that when they encountered it, they would know, aha, this is it. This is what John told us was coming. I recognize this. I'm ready to take it unto myself and make it my own, to take this life and make it a part of mine. But John says, even though the light and the power that created everything was in the world, the world did not recognize him, the world did not receive him, and the world did not accept him. This world is in darkness without Christ. Even when he came surrounded by the light of stars and angels, with heavenly choruses and all of these messengers, the world missed the fact that God was here, that God was here. But then he gives us a yet, and this is amazing, yet for those who receive him, to those who take him unto themselves, to those that actually accept the gift that God is freely offering you, he gives you that wisdom and that power to become children of God, not born of human will, but born from above, born of the Spirit means we can take that life and make it a part of our own, that we don't have to live to ourselves anymore. We don't have to live according to the the rules that the world gives us when we receive Christ into our lives. All of a sudden, we've been made new, and the slate has been wiped clean, and we've been given this opportunity to live the fullness of life that comes from God alone, not the things that we can take and manipulate from the world around us. And then John ends this way. This word, this power, this wisdom from God became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt means tabernacled or pitched a tent. In the Old Testament days, the tabernacle was the place of worship. It was set up wherever the people wandered around in the desert, and they gathered together as a community to worship God there, to lift up their offerings to God, to say, God, I'm here ready to make my my life right with you again. Jesus was that tabernacle, that tent. He moved into the neighborhood so that people could stream to God and receive the light and the life that God wanted to give all people. So what does any of this have to do with New Year's resolutions? I'm glad you asked. Uh, this has everything to do with where we start. I think very, too, very often I fail in keeping my resolutions because I, I start with me. I start with things that I think will make me happy. I reach for things outside of my soul and I say, look, if I only can exercise more and eat better, and save a little bit more money, and finally read those books that have been stacked up on my shelves for months that I've never gotten to, then I'll be happy. And when I begin to do these things at the beginning of the year and begin to rearrange my time, I realize I'm not happier, that I still feel empty. And I think that's why I fall away from keeping these these goals that we call resolutions. It's because they don't get at the need that really, truly exists deep down. I think John's gospel teaches us something about New Year's resolutions. It says, he says, don't start from the outside and then try to change the inside. Let God be your start and be changed from the inside out. That's the difference. If I try to to exercise on my own and I don't really enjoy exercising, it hurts in the beginning, it's always better if you're in that routine and you're in the, the, the mode, but when you haven't done it in a while, it's tough. If I start with God and say, Lord, I want to be a good steward of the body that you've given me, Lord, give me the strength and the power to begin this and to make this change in my life so that I can be more available to you. That's a different perspective. 
but we can't just do it alone. I think accomplishing these things for God, drawing near to God, making God at the center, and allowing him to change us from the inside out begins with prayer. We have to be in communion with God. We have to converse with God in order to receive that life and that word that God wants to give us. But we've also got to become familiar and one with this book. We've got to read it. We've got to wrestle with it. We've got to figure out what it's teaching us, the ways that it wants to change us, the ways that it talks about who we are, but who we can be in God, the ways that we are, our souls are crowded and covered with darkness until his light shines in. We have to be acquainted with this book. But, but next, John would say, you can't ever do it alone. You need somebody else in your life that has experienced this transformation, that has experienced the change that comes from above and has seen it work in their lives. You need them to come alongside of you in order to begin to get life, uh, live life through God and God alone. We all need a John in our life, somebody that can point us to the light that has already come into the world, somebody that can look at our situation and, and the, the fears that we have, the failures we've experienced, the hopes and dreams that we have, and say, I, this is where I see God working here in your life. I loved this video because it began to turn New, New Year's resolutions on its head, and it wasn't anymore, what can I take for myself to change my life? It was, what can I give in order to bring light to other people? And I loved the child who said, I, I'll go and I'll be a best friend to somebody, and, and I can do this, and so I can teach you to do this. That's, that's what it means to be John to somebody, to share the light of God with somebody else, to say, look, I've, I've experienced this, I've struggled with it, I wasn't always good at it, let me share what I know with you so that you can live this way as well. There was the little girl in the video that said, I'll give hugs and kisses and I'll give a toy. You know, the, the, the picture of the, the person running and struggling, that would be me uh, if I were to start that. And so to have somebody to come alongside me and to encourage me and to say, you're doing a good job, keep it up, would make all the difference in the world. We can't make life changes on our own. It takes others who have already made those changes or are struggling to keep them to come alongside of us and to encourage us. We have a greater rate of success in that way. That's why we're a church of small groups. That's where relationships happen. That's where we grow closer to God in relationship with others who are struggling with the day-to-day -day stuff of life, of picking up the kids from school, getting the homework done. How am I going to get the laundry done before soccer practice? We live life in community together, and we begin to understand how this word illuminates our daily lives and helps us in our daily struggles. Maybe, maybe that's where God's leading you this year, just to, to find that, that prayer partner as a start, maybe it's a running buddy, maybe it's a neighbor, uh, somebody that you can call up every day and say, hey, what did you get out of this reading that we're doing together today? Maybe it's a small group that you meet with once a week, and you know every week at this time I'm going to get together and, and I'm going to be intentional about my relationship with God. Maybe prayer is the start. Maybe talking to God every day, truly making that a part of your life, not just saying that you're going to do it, but setting aside that time even for five minutes as a start to do it. That puts God at the center, that changes you from the inside, and then that light shines from you outside and changes others. Do you get that? Uh, you can be that kind of light. You can be that kind of presence for others who live in darkness, but you've got to experience the light on your own before you can do that. This year, I want us to have a different kind of new year. I don't want us to just set goals that are going to fall by the wayside by the time we get to January 15th. I want us to set, set one singular aim before us. You ready? It's to live God's word as completely as possible, to live like Jesus. That's our singular aim. If we start there, I believe God's going to open the doors to have everything else happen as well because we can't find happiness in losing weight. We can't find happiness in being, eating healthy apart from Christ. There's, there's no way. But if we start with Christ, he'll add all of this stuff to us and we'll do it for his glory, not for ourselves. So make that your singular aim. Remembering that, that the word became flesh and lived among us and in Jesus we have seen the glory of God full of grace and truth. Live God's word this year and then go and teach others to do the same. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that... Your light is shown in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. And so, Lord, here we are at the end of another year with all of our accomplishments and victories, with all of our fears and our failures and our disappointments, 
with all of the anxieties we carry with us into the new year. Lord, this morning we just lay it at your feet. And we say, God, every victory has come because of you at work in me. Every fear and failure that I, I have in my heart and in my life, I know that you're with me as I go on the journey. And so, God, in 2014, I'm going to trust you. Lord, if there's an area of our lives that we've kept close to you, just that one little piece of our life, we've just closed the blinds and, and kept the windows shut. Lord, give us the strength and the trust to crack that window today. To let that one fiber optic, optic sized light just penetrate the darkness of that area to let you in. To let you give us the life that can come from you, not the things that we grab for ourselves. Lord, uh, we all need a John. Somebody to come alongside of us, to encourage us, to tell us we can do it, to tell us it will get better, to tell us that Jesus loves us so much, that he died on the cross so that we could be changed from the inside out. Lord, help us as we go into this new year to seek out others who are in need of a friend, to go and seek out others who are in need of encouragement, and to be John for those who are struggling, who are reaching, who are trying. Lord, we're thankful for all that you've done in our life, and we look forward to all that you're going to do. So be with us, Lord. We love you.